Welcome, everybody. This is uh, me testing out, potentially doing some streaming, some reaction content. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Aaron. I am one of the two co-hosts of the Seriously Wrong podcast. Uh, and the Seriously Wrong podcast is, uh, unlike a lot of the podcasts that streamers do, a heavily edited, highly produced um, we put a lot of energy and effort into every single word on that show. And I have been attracted to trying out streaming for a while just because it's such the opposite. It's just like do it live and, you know, maybe edit a bit after, but probably not just throw it up there. And, uh, it is how it is super attractive, especially since I've been doing so much editing and just like, um, yeah, it's a lot. And also I think the debate culture of streamers is like super interesting. I've been watching a bunch of it and as a long time keyboard warrior, I feel like I have a lot of, uh, I'd really like to try out some of this, debating stuff and just or just like conversations with people about disagreements or about agreements or about all kinds of stuff in, in a way where we don't have to like do comedy sketches for it and edit them all down and uh you know like we do on uh seriously wrong uh, the podcast um so yeah, we'll see. This is a test. I'm not actually streaming this. I'm just recording because uh, as much as I want to get away from the editing and just fuck it, do it live, uh, you know, I want to wait in. I'm testing it out. Uh, we'll see how much I actually edit this video before posting it or if I end up doing another take as it's not the first time. Ugh. That was a nice one. <laughs> it's not the first time I've uh, started this video. So, yeah, I think that's all the intro stuff I wanted to do. Uh, Sean's not going to be on this stream. I'm just going to react to a video. Um, that's how you wade into being a debate bro. I think you debate a video. It's, it's easier than debating a person, uh, for sure. And... Um, yeah, I guess the last thing is I'll say I'm going to get a better camera. This isn't a very good camera. It only does 720p. I think it cost me like $30 like years ago, many years ago. Multiple many years ago. Uh, so, yeah, we'll see about getting a new one. And i uh, going to debate a video. So, uh, ooh, how to explain this? Um, this video was um, sent to me by someone who I was keyboard warrior debating. Uh, and I think I'll just say that the, I'll characterize the, the substance of our ongoing debate. I talked to this person quite a bit in DMs uh, for a while. Uh, and I would characterize the substance of our disagreement as they believed that I was too naive about how the left and progressives are being weaponized by the powerful uh, in order to, to further their own ends. Essentially, that most of what we think of as progressive causes in the, the current year are... Um, sort of part of the system, I guess we'll say. And um, <clears throat> my contention was more that corporations, governments, etc., to the extent that they um, I was about to say pay lip service to, but that's not even quite what I mean. To, to the extent that they push 
anti-racism, anti-homophobia, anti-sexism, you know, curious silence on the anti-class divide, income inequality stuff, at least in terms of anything actionable. Um, The extent to which those issues have been recuperated by the powerful is the extent to which they can use parts of it or allow parts of it to happen as long as they don't challenge their power. Uh, And I just became aware that I'm talking about this vague they as if people are logically thinking through the thought chain that I just laid out, like these horrible people. It's not what I mean uh, at all, really. What, What I'm saying is that A lot of well-meaning people who went to university and who understand that racism, sexism, homophobia, even class stuff to an extent is a problem are working and all these come like these, this awareness is spreading throughout society that these problems are real. And it's true that to some extent addressing them can happen under capitalism but the extent to which that is a deep and meaningful addressal of these issues i think is under uh is something i would i would be hesitant to to give them a lot of credit on um again i slipped right into the they thing but what i'm saying is that these well-meaning people at these companies introduce these initiatives and things but like Ultimately, every company has to make money and make a profit and do all that. And public relations is part of that. And to some extent, you can use the idea that, oh, we need to um, virtue signal, I guess, for lack of a better term, uh, to the public about how we're against racism. Um we can do that partially by actually giving money to charities who are doing real good anti-racism work. Uh, it's part of the reason I hate the term virtue signaling is because a lot of the time virtue signaling can actually do good things. And like we can have progress on social issues under cap, like capitalism doesn't care if gay people can get married. If anything, it's better for capitalism that gay people can get married in a sort of like vacuum or whatever, like an ahistorical vacuum of like neoliberal number crunching, Uh, more gay weddings, more happy gay people theoretically could mean more economic activity. Uh, And so I think that sort of understanding really has gripped a lot of people. And uh, it was my interpretation of my conversation with this person that uh, a bit too much stock was being put into that or like there wasn't enough of a distinction being made for my liking between what the most powerful versions of these ideas could net society if they were taken seriously and implemented in a holistic fashion rather than being sort of subservient to this profit motive thing, Um, like where that could take us versus what's actually on offer. I think maybe his perspective is that I just have all these ideals that in practice just turn into these pro corporation things or whatever. So he sent me this video, which is called the system's neatest trick lays out essentially a version of this argument that I've been talking about. And, uh, when he first sent it to me, I like skipped through parts of it. And I was like, Oh, this part where they're describing that, an article about gay people or gay marriage or something as an example as to how even right-wing media was kind of pro-gay. Like you can just tell that the, the system wants 
gay rights and that's not um an anti-system position or whatever and yeah and i re so i responded to that with a counter argument that I'll just wait to give until I get to that part of the video. So I remember exactly what it said, but, uh, by skipping through the video and not reading the video description and kind of not doing some of that, uh, basic due diligence, I think I, uh, spent some of my potential credibility in arguing against it, uh, just by being like, Oh, I skimmed through it. And this thing sounds stupid. And I did disagree with it, uh, because I, I missed a lot of like, information obviously by skimming but also context by not realizing that the system's neatest trick is a ted kaczynski essay and that this video is a quote-unquote visual audio book of that short essay and i think just when i was like looking back to the video to thinking about making this uh response to it uh, and being like, I'm actually going to go through the video uh, for the first time. I was like, oh, this is Ted. K this is the Unabomber. What the fuck? So, yeah, this is an essay that the Unabomber wrote. It was published in 2010, I think, in a book called um, Technological Slavery. And I'm... fascinated to go through the whole thing i've watched a bit more of it now but not quite all of it and um yeah i've never read ted kaczynski i never read the manifesto uh i understand my basic understanding is that he is a primitivist of some kind i'm not really sure uh like an ideological bias, but, um, or what his ideological bias is, if it's more like, I guess, right-leaning or left-leaning primitivism. Uh, so I don't know. We'll, we'll see. We'll find out. I don't actually know if this video talks about primitive. It didn't from what I remember. It's just about how social movements are part of the system all right so i'm gonna i even made a little border thing for my uh <laughs> i have to google this um video audio book or what was it visual audio book i'm gonna find it full visual audio book there we go <laughs> and then new to this whole streaming thing how does that look see on the little border around me oh yeah 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 Streamlabs live i didn't do the transition thing here it is hey all right let's do this oh i need the headphones I almost said, let me know if this is too loud to the chat that's not here. So. My streamer instincts already kicked in. I'm going to turn up the audio. I'm going to turn up the speed, I mean. Jeez. The 
supreme luxury of the society of technical necessity will be to grant the bonus of useless revolt and of an acquiescent smile. Jean Part 1. What the system is not. Let's begin by making clear what the system is not. The system is not George W. Bush and his advisors and appointees. It is not the cops who maltreat protesters. It is not the CEOs of the multinational corporations. And it is not the Frankensteins in their laboratories who criminally tinker with the genes of living things. That's a bit of primitivism, I guess, equating um, these various criminals. I kind of forget everything they just said, except for George Bush and his... I was just floored by immediately oh george bush and his cronies are not the system it seems like they were the system like being the president of the most powerful country in the world uh and starting one of the most consequential wars of multiple decades that yeah it's a it's a seems like if we want to talk about the actions of the system that matters that those ones are a big part of it but um, maybe they'll argue against that sort of obviousness uh but yeah uh equating gmos with all that horrible stuff george bush did that i just mentioned uh some some there's the primitivism. All of these people are servants of the system, but in themselves they do not constitute the system. In particular, the personal and individual values, attitudes, beliefs, and behavior of any of these people may be significantly in conflict with the needs of the system. To illustrate an example, the system requires respect for property rights, yet CEOs, cops, scientists, and politicians sometimes steal. In speaking of stealing, we don't have to confine ourselves to actual lifting of physical objects. We can include all illegal means of acquiring property, such as cheating on income tax, accepting bribes, and any other form of graft or corruption. But the fact that CEOs, cops, scientists, and politicians sometimes steal does not mean that stealing is part of the system. Okay, um, first point. If this is where it gets really tricky using such a vague term as the system and like what is the system and what isn't the system is this the, like that's I'm already seeing a lot of issues with this whole framing uh, but just in terms of this specific point that was being made the idea that stealing the question of whether stealing is or is not part of the system really, again, depends on what we're talking about because oh, how do I say this? Maybe this is going somewhere, but on the surface, it seems like it seems pretty facile to me to say that, I guess, basically because stealing is against the law and because stealing is a violation of property rights which is like you know if i was going to be talking about the system i would say the system is capitalism and capitalism is based on private property rights and it's absolutely true that stealing goes against that but to say that that means stealing is not part of the system then to me you're defining the system as this perfect potential expression of these ideals. But like my perspective is that property rights, having a society with the type of property rights that we have now, as opposed to other types of property rights, necessitates stealing not only because people are going to end up with not having enough and their basic biological drives therefore driving them to steal but also because the every incentive system is set up with money as a goal and acquisition as status and acquisition of money and wealth as the 
means by which you can have more say in the political system than other people. So given all those conditions, stealing is inevitable. Stealing has to happen for this system to exist and interact with human beings. And another point about this is that even if you want to say technically stealing is not part of the system or whatever, um, oh, I have this super janky camera <laughs> set up. I'll maybe include a screenshot when I edit. Uh, I'll get something better when I get a new camera, as I mentioned, but I feel like I'm... <sighs> Should be fine. <laughs> what was I saying? Uh, the system, the system is stealing part of the... Oh, yeah. Another reason I don't like the framing of, you know, because it's against the law, it's not part of the system, um, is that it obscures things that the system, the society that we're living in reliably does. And that I think it's fair to say, therefore, is part of the system, despite being against the written um, letter of what the, the ideals of the system would lead you to believe. So um, not only is stealing sort of necessitated by the structure of what's going on, the ways in which different people who steal are treated differently by the system. And we can say that's all also not really part of the system. The fact that, you know, rich people committing white collar crimes get much different punishments than poor people committing blue collar crimes just in general uh despite the crimes being higher value in many many instances uh seems like a reliable part of the system um sentencing uh, sentencing uh, um, disparities between people of different racial groups. Like here in Canada, um, a lot of indigenous people and also black people, um, probably other racialized groups in, in America, obviously, black people and other racialized groups suffer from this sort of thing. Um, <laughs> If you rob a bank when you're black in America, it's likely that you're going to get a longer sentence than if you rob a bank if you're white in America. If you do the exact same thing, same priors, match history, et cetera, that's been studied. That's a fact. So it's like, if that's not part of the system, then it's just a thing that's happening that's rely like it's still a bad thing and so therefore it seems like you would still want to address it even if addressing it makes the system god i hate this whole system for i'm just going to get back to <laughs> the video on the contrary when a cop or politician steals something, he is rebelling against the system's requirement of respect for law and property. Yet even when they are stealing, these people remain servants of the system as long as they publicly maintain their support for law and property. Whatever illegal acts may be committed by politicians, cops, or CEOs as individuals, theft, bribery, and graft are not part of the system, but diseases of the system. The less stealing there is, the better the system functions. I think I agree with that. Diseases of the system. The less stealing there is, the better the system functions. Um, yeah, it's also vague. Like, better for who? It's not better for... It's weird, because it's not better for the richest people in society if there's less stealing. And it's not necessarily better for the poorest people in society if there's less stealing either depending on which stealing we're talking about 
Um, so the better the system functions is just too vague of a term. Like the, I think what they're saying is that the better it functions in terms of maintaining respect for property rights, which is again, like the letter of what the system is supposed to be about. And that is why the servants and boosters of the system always advocate obedience to the law in public, even if they may sometimes find it convenient to break the law in private. Take another example. Although the police are the system's enforcers, police brutality is not part of the system. When the cops beat the crap out of a suspect, they are not doing the system's work. They are only letting out their own anger and hostility. The system's goal is not brutality or the expression of anger. As far as police work is concerned, the system's goal is to compel obedience to its rules and to do so with the least possible amount of disruption, violence, and bad publicity. Ugh. Okay. <clears throat> so many things. It's amazing how many things I need to say after how short of a th thing we listen to. Um... Again, if we're talking about the letter of the, like, if we're talking about wanting the most respect for property rights and therefore for the system in general, like, I, I want to grant that there's a sense in which it's better for the system, the system, if there is no police brutality and if everything is like nice, nice capitalism, nice police, they enforce the laws in the lightest possible touch like that would be good for capitalism i guess for the system um at the same time and again depending on how we define the system it's hard to talk about defining the system in america without talking about these things that keep happening. Like I was, um, <sighs> a minute ago talking about stealing and how like rich people stealing, poor people stealing are a thing that keeps happening in this. And it seems to come from the way the system's set up. So it seems like it's part of the system in a sense, but then at the same time, like or for, for police brutality, it keeps happening. And one way how we can understand, like I, I don't think that comes from respect for property rights, but it comes, well, in a, in a sense it does. Um, just thinking about how the first, I think this is true, the first police in the United States, police forces, maybe as a separate thing from sheriffs, or I can't quite remember. Uh, a major historical part of the process of police come, becoming what they are in America today was the formation of slave patrols, of, of police basically set up to go capture escaped slaves and bring them back to their slave owners because of property rights. And those slaves were the property of people. Um, so in a sense, it does come back to property rights, but the whole founding of America comes on the heels of centuries of colonialism and of European people using, you know, people from Africa as slaves to build a lot of wealth in a lot of different countries. And especially in America and in a sense, the system of America was founded through was, was founded with white supremacy written into its founding documents, the constitution and I think I just got hung up because I don't remember if the video mentioned any racial aspects of police brutality or just said police brutality. Um, and I started talking about the history of like colonialism and racism and stuff because the 
history of policing and racism is tied together. But like the whole history of America is tied to colonialism and to slavery. And those things are against the law now. But the ongoing effects of those things are, again, one of those things like stealing that seem to still be part of the system for reasons we can identify despite not being the legal part like the what you would expect a well-functioning proprietarian capitalist society to want which is the good again a good point they wouldn't it would work better without police brutality but when you place it in historical context it makes sense why there is police brutality and why it's part of the system. Thus, from the system's point of view, the ideal cop is one who never gets angry, never uses any more violence than necessary, and as far as possible relies on manipulation rather than force to keep people under control. Police brutality is only another disease of the system, not part of the system. For proof, let's look at the attitude of the media. The mainstream media almost universally condemns police brutality. Of course, the attitude of the mainstream media represents, as a rule, the consensus of opinion among the powerful classes in our society as to what is good for the system. Okay, so first I want to respond to this disease of the system framing because I actually like like it and I kind of agree with it. Like, I, I can get down with that framing that the system is this perfect everyone's respecting property rights nobody ever steals like this utopian capitalism there's no racism sexism everyone's super productive and um atomized individuals who are celebrated in their diversity but are good workers and entrepreneurs even you know from all walks of life um uh, that could be what we're defining the system as. And if it is, then all of these diseases of the system, uh, I like the, I like the term diseases of the system because it implies that they're coming from it. Nevertheless, despite not being what it is in the framing or whatever. I think the reason I'm objecting to this so much is because I just kind of know where it's going or at least what it was being used for in the argument that I was having with a person. Um, so I'm, you know, partially always responding to how this was framed to me and again, echoes of knowing Kaczynski's a primitivist and whatnot. Um, next point. is something not part of the system because the mainstream media is against it. Like I agree in a sense that the mainstream media generally represents the consensus among powerful classes and society as to what's good for the system. Um, you know, most powerful people seem to be liberals, like fairly economically conservative liberals, but you know, not always sometimes so more social Democrat, uh, oriented. Um, and basically that's what you see in the mainstream media. You also see a lot of, how do I put this? Um, yeah, it's weird because we just define things out of the mainstream. If they decide like Fox news is mainstream media and you can be like, Oh, it's the only one that's not liberal. Uh, which is true in a sense, but even then, like conservatives are liberal. Like Fox News is the only one that openly flirts with fascism, but like CNN, MSNBC, all these places have conservative streaks in them. Um, anyway, I don't know where I got on conservative and liberal uh, having a shadow boxing argument in my head, I think with someone, but the... Uh, Yeah, just this idea that like, oh, the mainstream media said it, so it's not part of the system. Like, is Trump not part of the system because the mainstream media in general didn't like him and because 
the consensus of the powerful classes in general was that the society would be better without him as the president. I don't know. You could call him a disease of the system, but I think he's just part of the system. He's a wealthy person who gained power through accumulating property that he was able to do because he inherited property and uh, is charismatic. And yeah, if that's not part of this, like that just seems like a really essential main part of the system. Like I don't, yeah. And the mainstream media was against him. So I continue to have to object to this the system framing media represents as a rule the consensus of opinion among the powerful classes in our society as to what is good for the system what has just been said about theft graft and police brutality applies also to issues of discrimination and victimization such as racism sexism homophobia poverty and sweatshops all of these are bad for the system for example, the more that black people feel themselves scorned or excluded, the more likely they are to turn to crime and the less likely they are to educate themselves for careers that will make them useful to the system. Again, I, oh, it's just so unproductively mixing things together here. But to say I can see a version of utopian capitalism where, like I said, there's no racism, sexism, like everyone's that, like they're saying, may, they, they can get careers that make them useful to the system. Everyone's an entrepreneur. You know, if the best CEO for the job is a gay black man, then hooray, gay b lesbian woman, <laughs> Asian, whatever. Diversity is, Diversity makes systems stronger, I think, no matter what. And if you want to have a good capitalist system, I think it makes sense that some of them would recognize that. At the same time, to say that poverty is not part of the system seems especially objectionable like to lump that one in there with the other ones when when you look at corporate wokeness or whatever corporates corporations taking on these social issues it is usually social issues and not economic issues like i haven't seen the big campaign from coca-cola to eliminate poverty in the same way i've seen the big campaign from coca-cola to uh or not a big camp i'm <laughs> being hyperbolic but in the same way that like all these corporations will change their profile picture to black lives matter or to uh, pride during pride month um and so on i don't see them doing that when it comes to taxing corporations a whole bunch more and using that money to fund free social housing for everybody to eliminate that aspect of poverty um, or to anybody who needs it or to have like, you know, social housing available to everyone for 10% of their income, regardless of if their income is zero, then it's zero. If their income's 100K a year, it's 10K a year. I don't see Coca-Cola advocating for that in the same way they're advocating for pride parades. And I think there's a reason for that is that pride parades are a bit more compatible with the system than eliminating poverty in real substantial ways like that would be. And the reason for that is that the system of respecting private property and respecting people's ability to accumulate as much private property as possible uh, and to like to not have those rights violated, right? Taxation is theft, as the libertarian right wing libertarians like to remind us uh, <laughs> from them. So, like the ideal capitalist system with no theft would probably have no taxation. Like when I have spoken to ANCAPs about their ideal society, it doesn't have taxation, and like. Poverty is necessary for poverty is relative. <laughs> so it's important to mention that. And people will be like, oh, the poorest people now are better off than whoever, however many years ago. And that may or may not be true, depending on which metrics we're using. But 
there's an inherent conflict between property rights, essential, like keep maintaining respect for property rights and eliminating poverty, because the main way to do that is to infringe on people's property rights, to redistribute property. So just saying that eliminating poverty is part of the system seems really wrong to me. It seems like a major blind spot of that sentence. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it'll be addressed. Modern technology, with its rapid long distance transportation and its disruption of traditional ways of life, has led to the mixing of populations, so that nowadays people of different races, nationalities, cultures, and religions have to live and work side by side. If people hate or reject one another on the basis of race, ethnicity, religion, sexual preference, etc., the resulting conflicts interfere with the functioning of the system. Apart from a few old fossilized relics of the past like Jesse Helms, the leaders of the system know this very well. And that is why we are taught in school and through the media to believe that racism, sexism, homophobia, and so forth are social evils to be eliminated. No doubt some of the leaders of the system, some of the politicians... Just notice that they didn't mention poverty in that sentence. Threw it in at the beginning there, but like, you just knew, like, we're not... Maybe we're taught in schools that poverty should be eliminated, sure, but we're not taught in schools that... <laughs> uh we need to fundamentally alter the way the property system works in order to do that. I, I mean, maybe that's just my assumption that's different and what's causing this this rift between me and the Unabomber <laughs> here who wrote this a video essay that I'm responding to. But like, I think if we want to eliminate poverty, we have to fundamentally change the way the system works so to saying that yeah scientists and ceos privately feel that a woman's place is in the home or that homosexuality and interracial marriage are repugnant but even if the majority of them felt that way it would not mean that racism sexism and homophobia were part of the system any more than the existence of stealing among the leaders means that stealing is part of the system just as the system must promote respect for law and property for the sake of its own security, the system must also discourage racism and other forms of victimization for the same reason. That is why the system, notwithstanding any private deviations by individual members of the elite, is basically committed to suppressing discrimination and victimization. Victimization is a broad term there. If you mean victimization of people based on race... Uh... Yeah, I don't know, if you just automatically define every example that I could give that doesn't support this as like personal deviations by people in power because it doesn't meet this criteria of this perfectly functioning utopian version of the system that you're defining as the system, uh, there's no real way I can argue with this point. But yeah, I to go on i'll just be repeating points i've made i think it makes sense for why proof, i disagree look again to the attitude of the mainstream media in spite of occasional timid dissent by a few of the more daring and reactionary commentators media propaganda overwhelmingly favors racial and gender equality and acceptance of homosexuality and interracial marriage and note number two even the most superficial review of the mass media in modern industrialized countries or even in countries that merely aspire to modernity this is the part that I watched when skimming through. We'll confirm that the system is committed to eliminating discrimination in regard to race, <clears throat> religion, gender, sexual orientation, etc., etc., etc. It would be easy to find thousands of examples that illustrate this, but here we cite only three from three disparate countries. The United States. Public Displays of Affection, U.S. News and World Report. September 9th, 2002, pages 42 to 43. This article provides a nice example of the way propaganda functions. It takes an ostensibly objective or neutral position on homosexual partnerships, giving some space to the views of those who oppose public acceptance of homosexuality. But anyone reading the article, with its distinctly sympathetic treatment of a homosexual couple, will be left with the impression that acceptance of homosexuality is desirable, and in the long run, inevitable. Particularly important is the photograph of the homosexual couple in question. A physically attractive pair has been selected, and has been f Why would you add that? Whoever made this video essay <laughs> stupid
it sounds like they just interviewed a gay couple, weren't shitty to them, like distinctly sympathetic, made it seem like it's inevitable. Those things seem like they would just be true at that point in time, early 2000s. Like, let me just Google this. I want to read this article quickly. Oh, maybe it's not online. I want to see this picture. I want to see what the uh, the extremely attractive couple look like. Uh, oh, I took my hat off. So it seems to me There's a bias in reality towards sympathy, towards gay people who want to have the same rights as heterosexual people in general. I think that in order to make the argument that they shouldn't, you have to distort things or have a distorted perspective to begin with. And... How do I say this? Um, oops. It just seems like the best thing that this conservative magazine could do at this point in time in 2002 was to both sides this issue and to be like, yeah, well, obviously, like, <laughs> people are getting more and more sympathetic to gay people. They've realized they're not all monsters. They're not all out for to turn your kids gay or whatever. And a lot more public sympathy through simple exposure was the norm. And so the best thing that the conservative magazine could do, it, it's both sides it and say, oh, you know, we'll give space to the views of those who oppose public, like, there's a sense in which even giving space to the those who oppose public accept, acceptance of homosexuality, in my mind, is biased against homosexuality. Like, it's a hard thing because we get into territory here of like, who should be allowed to say what and, you know, all these free speech birds chirping in my ear hearing objections from like uh certain people but <sighs> it shows the bias inherent in the system against homosexuality that this is even a question worth writing about that's another way to frame this i guess is the simplest way to to put it um i already listened to all this okay Let's 26 do Putin. 2002 page 16a moscow president vladimir putin strongly denounces racial and religious prejudice on thursday if we let this chauvinistic bacteria of either national or religious intolerance develop we will ruin the country putin said in remarks prominently replayed on russian television on thursday night etc etc mexico Persiste racismo contra indígenas. Racism against indigenous people persists. El Sol de México, January 11, 2002, page 1 slash B. Photo caption. In spite of efforts to give dignity to the indigenous people of our country, they continue to suffer discrimination. The article reports on the efforts of the bishops of Mexico to combat discrimination, but says that the bishops want to purify indigenous customs in order to liberate the women from their traditionally inferior status. El Sol de México is reputed to be a right-of-center newspaper. Anyone who wanted to take the trouble could multiply these examples a thousand times over. The evidence that the system itself is set on eliminating discrimination and victimization is so obvious and so massive that one boggles at the radicals' belief that fighting these evils is a form of rebellion. Okay, wow. Yeah, see, this is, I knew it was leading to this, and this is why I've been objecting so hard. Just because right of center magazines claim to support feminism, claim to support whatever 
particular issue, racial justice, like just because Vladimir Putin claims to be against nationalism doesn't mean that they are. The simplest way I think to put this disagreement is that I think Kaczynski thinks that this shows that they're all secretly truly in favor of these ideas in a deep way. Whereas to me, it says that these ideas are inherently attractive to people and the spread of them has been difficult for the powerful to stop. And the reason they want to stop them is not that racism is nationalism is sexism homophobia is harmful to a utopian version of a proprietarian system but because historically speaking the people who hold power in this system don't benefit from power being redistributed along all those lines. They especially don't benefit from it being redistributed on class lines. And I noticed they haven't mentioned poverty again in this, like, because virtue signaling about poverty is a lot harder to frame as truly being against poverty than virtue signaling against racism, sexism, homophobia. Like, Coca-Cola says they're against homophobia and the people who buy this sort of Kaczynski view on things think oh they truly really are they'll do anything to like they're revealing their true beliefs or the media is pushing this on people whereas I'm saying the media is playing catch-up because they noticed that people when presented with the arguments when presented with the reality of living in close space with people of different races, of knowing that their friends might be gay or trans, of these things being spoken about in the open, women telling us all how they've been let down by the system so far and, and what to do to address that. Oh, I lost my train of thought. Um, all those things. Are intertwined with poverty and are, but are different from it. And uh, yeah, I just, I noticed he's not. Oh yeah. The different, like. <laughs> If Coca-Cola says they're against poverty, but then don't do anything about it, it seems a lot more hollow than if they say, like, saying something about homophobia is a lot more like doing something than saying something about poverty. One can only attribute it to a phenomenon well known to professional propagandists. People tend to block out, to fail to perceive or to remember information that conflicts with their ideology. See the interesting article, Propaganda in the New Encyclopedia Britannica, Volume 26, Macropedia, 15th edition, 1997, pages 171. To oh, yeah, I <laughs> completely forgot. So, yeah, the, like, <sighs> all this said, all this charity that I've been giving to these arguments about how, sure, racism isn't necessarily against a perfectly functioning version of capitalism, but historically it seems to be deeply tied to and in part of the system. Um, yeah, it just comes down again to like how you define the system when you're talking about whether fighting against racism is against the system. And then when you start getting to how these things overlap with poverty, like we can talk all about how it's good to support racial justice but when we talk about materially supporting that like you know reparations there's crickets from the powerful right like if the if the powerful were this opposed to racism and to rectify and like committed to rectifying the history of white supremacy in America why aren't why isn't the mainstream media hopping on the reparations bandwagon with the highest possible numbers like the the 
however many acres in a mule thing. I saw, I saw a calculation once and it was like, if we extrapolate to what that wealth would have meant generation, generationally, it's like a super high estimate. It was like trillions of dollars should be going to the black community to make up for this. Um, if they were truly, truly committed to anti-racism and the way they say they were, they would be pushing for that, but they're not. Because only a neutered version of anti-racism and these other things is acceptable to the system. It's not it's not the whole hog. They're they're not actually doing it. Specifically page one seventy six. And that's why fighting against these things is still fighting against the system. The system needs a population that is meek, non-violent, domesticated, docile, and obedient. It needs to avoid any conflict or disruption that could interfere with the orderly functioning of the social machine. In addition to suppressing racial, ethnic, religious, and other group hostilities, it also has to suppress or harness, for its own advantage, all other tendencies that could lead to disruption or disorder, such as machismo, aggressive impulses, and any inclination to violence. Naturally, I don't know about that. Any inclination to vi like, how are you going to defend property rights without violence? Like the system, if we're, this came from the video, like I'm not just imposing capitalism onto the system because that's what I believe. The video has mentioned multiple times, the essay Kaczynski has mentioned multiple times that property rights are essential part of the system and that these things serve property rights and it just doesn't seem like they do like yeah just the, yeah. traditional racial and ethnic antagonisms die slowly machismo aggressiveness and violent impulses are not easily suppressed and, and just yeah it gets back to the police brutality thing like i guess yeah there's a utopian vision of cap where nobody's ever violent to one another and we don't even need police because everyone just naturally doesn't steal because they all have enough, right, you know? But then, is it even capitalism? I don't know. I feel like that point didn't land the way it, yeah. Attitudes towards sex and gender identity are not transformed overnight. Therefore, there are many individuals who resist these changes, and the system is faced with the problem of overcoming their resistance. End note number three. In this section, I've said something about what the system is not. Okay, hold on. So, <clears throat> just watch that again. Machismo, aggressiveness, and violent impulses are not easily suppressed, and attitudes towards machismo. I'm just mixing these things together. Aggressive impulses. The ease with which a person can suppress their aggressive impulses depends a lot on how much their needs are getting met. And maintaining property rights makes it difficult to meet everybody's needs. And I guess that could just be a disease of the system, but it, again, it seems like part of the system. And machismo is not something that's like just hard to suppress. Like it's essentially just male ego and like ego is hard for everyone to suppress at times, depending on what skills you've been given or developed on your own, etc. But like, machismo is also something that has to be taught like it's a version of male ego of what men are supposed to be like ego being like i am this i am great i'm a man i'm a big man like that's machismo i agree that once it's there it's not easily suppressed sometimes for people but also you have to create it in the first place. Like it's treating certain things as inherently natural when they're 
more contextual and then just saying that the system wants to like sand all these edges off and like make people non-aggressive non-racist not because that would be good for this utopian vision of capitalism but like at best i can say that this this drive that they're discussing makes sense as one of the many conflicting drives that neoliberal capitalism talking about it as a meta system that can have drives itself or whatever which is already kind of problematic but doing that what they're describe what kaczynski is describing here is one of those drives but just to define that as the system seems wrong sex and gender identity are not transformed overnight therefore there are many individuals who resist these changes and the system is faced with the problem of overcoming their resistance end note number three in this section i've said something about what the system is not but i haven't said what the system is a friend of mine has pointed out that this may leave the reader nonplussed so i'd better explain that for the purposes of this article I'm excited. Uncle, it isn't necessary to have a precise definition of what the system is. I couldn't think of any way of defining the system in a single, well-rounded sentence, and I didn't want to break the continuity of the article with a long, awkward, and unnecessary digression, addressing the question of what the system is. Instead of writing a long, awkward, unnecessary end note, uh, <laughs> to addressing the question of why you're not addressing the question of what the system is, you could have just used, like... Sure, you don't want to digress during the article. Do it in an end note. You had a great idea here for a place where this just like it's, seems seems beneficial to you to not have to define that because. So I left the question unanswered. I don't think that my failure to answer it will seriously impair the reader's understanding of the point that I want to make in this article. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Is this another song? All of us in modern system exploits the impulse to rebel. All of us in modern society are hemmed in by a dense network of rules and regulations. We are at the mercy of large organizations such as corporations, governments, labor unions, universities, churches, and political parties. And consequently, we are powerless. As a result of the servitude, the power... I don't think we're powerless. I think the system wants us to believe we're powerless. Um, or at least it's beneficial to the system, but obviously we're not. Like workers in like most people do work that's important for society even if i don't <laughs> necessarily um or like the i'm not i'm not an essential worker but many many people are and they at least have power all workers have power in their workplace we have a certain amount of power even within this not so great version of democracy to influence outcomes of the system that way just saying people are powerless is absolutely wrong um i agree that the system exploits the impulse to rebel and that's part of what woke corporations etc are doing they're recuperating this energy into something that's more in line with capital and neutering it as i mentioned but that's that's how it exploits the system to rebel. I'm not, not what I think they're, where they're going. Powerlessness and the other indignities that the system inflicts on us, there is widespread frustration, which leads to an impulse to rebel. And this is where the system- That's true. That's true. <laughs> I wouldn't call it powerlessness, but like relative powerlessness, not less pat like the unequal distribution of power is- an affront to people's sense of justice, I think, and that leads to a desire to rebel, for sure. The system plays its neatest trick. Through a brilliant sleight of hand, it turns rebellion to its own advantage. True. Many people do not understand the roots of their own frustration, hence their rebellion is True. directionless. They know that they True. want to rebel, but they don't know what they want to rebel against. 
true. And then they watch some sh video like this and <sighs> it plays into their biases because they're annoyed by the cherry picked version of the worst SJW takes they've ever seen that combined with the time someone called them racist for something trivial. <sighs> and that undifferentiated desire to rebel gets redirected towards fighting against anti-racists, fighting against people who want to make a more equal society along various lines. Luckily, the system is able to fill their need by providing them with a list of standard and stereotyped grievances in the name of which to rebel. Racism, homophobia, women's issues, poverty, sweatshops, the whole laundry bag of activist issues. <sighs> There's a bunch there, but like this almost seems to imply that the reason the system has sweatshops is so that they can give activists something to rebel against. Like... <sighs> Them talking about how the system grinds people down and makes them powerless goes against what they're saying about the system being truly dedicated to fighting racism, sexism, homophobia, violence, et cetera, et cetera. Like, how are you going to sand off people's aggressive tendencies without getting rid of the resentment that comes from having massive dis dis disparate distributions of wealth where like some people are extremely poor and other people have far too much uh deprivation contributes to aggression so like if they want to get rid of aggression and if they want to get rid of racial wealth imbalance if they want to equalize everyone across all these lines you have to do it holistically that's what intersectionality is about you can't address all of these other things without also addressing class is my main point. And they're all important and class is important too. And to say that these issues are just provided to people seems wrong. It seems like they have been pushed by activists up from the bottom into public consciousness and now the system is scrambling to know what to do with them huge numbers of would-be rebels take the bait in fighting racism sexism etc etc they are only doing the system's work for it in spite of this they imagine that they are rebelling against the system how is this possible first 50 years ago, the system was not yet committed to equality for black people, women, and homosexuals. So that action in favor of these causes really was a form of rebellion. Consequently, these causes came to be conventionally regarded as rebel causes. When did it change? Uh, oh, oh, <laughs> I thought he was saying property inherently, like those things have been diseases, deviations of the system since, for, like they're saying that system changed recently and now it's against these things. When did it change? when i guess like yeah the right it's a kind of an obvious answer it changed when civil rights movement women getting the right to vote etc but like we, we haven't even got the equal rights amendment like there's like it seems like this is a, this is a point that came up with someone else that has similar views to this but there's this misunderstanding among people who argue stuff like this in my opinion about the nature of hegemony and that the system being racist and sexist for centuries doesn't get erased and completely flipped in a few decades not when the the lingering effects of that system still have so much momentum behind them I don't think we're getting to the point where we can say those things are no longer part of the system until they're actually not affecting reality anymore. 
the the thing that the system is uh, a, a, an abstraction of the way our society functions. The way our society functions still has all these things in it. So what is the system then, if it's not an abstraction of the way our society functions? It's the system, it seems to me, according to Ted Kaczynski, is the effects of empathetic narratives gaining popularity in new situate like the world becoming smaller due to the internet due to um transportation technology like people moving country to country uh the the world becoming smaller exposure to people of different groups of various kinds making these empathetic narratives more attractive and the people who are slower to jump on them feeling attacked for being slower to jump on them for still having these biases in various ways that we all do in various ways the i understand how you feel like it's the system when all of a sudden everyone's calling you racist for whatever thing you thought was normal and it feels like it's coming from everywhere but that doesn't mean that it's the system because you're It just seems like you're still dealing with the lingering effects of a part of the system that has been successfully, to some extent anyway, successfully argued against in the public sphere, in the ecology of the ideas, the, the non-marketplace of ideas, the ecology of ideas that is society. They have retained that status today simply as a matter of tradition. That is because each rebel generation imitates the preceding generation. It's not just tradition. It's the material effects of those centuries that continue to exist in society today. It's not just like, oh, it's tradition that these things are are thought of as, as rebellious. The, the, the thing that they're rebelling against are still going on materially. Second, there are still significant numbers of people, as I pointed out earlier, who resist the social changes that the system requires. And some of these people even are authority figures. This is it. Oh, I'm resisting what the system requires, not I'm resisting the uptake of these new empathetic narratives that seem to be popular such as cops, judges, and politicians. These resistors provide a target for the would-be rebels. Popular in certain, like popular on Twitter, popular among liberals who write articles in a lot of the mainstream news, like... Someone for them to rebel against. Commentators like Rush Limbaugh help the process by ranting against these activists. Seeing that they are making someone angry fosters the activists' illusion that they are rebelling. Third. Why why isn't Rush part, like, isn't Rush Limbaugh part of the system? Like, is he just pretending to be mad at them or he's like a useful idiot? To, I mean, he is a useful idiot, but not. I don't think in the way that this video is implying in order to bring themselves into conflict even with that majority of the system's leaders who fully accept the social changes that the system demands the would-be rebels insist on solutions that go farther than what the system's leaders consider prudent and they show ex exaggerated anger over trivial matters okay <sighs> yes sure sometimes i've seen exaggerated anger over trivial matters but i've also seen just demanding more action on these things than would be prudent. What does that mean? Does like actually addressing racism, like the the reparations example I gave earlier, uh, not that that's the only way you could address racism, but I don't see them materially addressing it in any other way either. So the activists are just like, hey, actually address it. Don't just talk about it. And then Kaczynski says, they're asking for more than is prudent to the system. Yeah, 
actually addressing it is not prudent to the system. You're so close, Kaczynski. For example, they demand payment of reparations to black people, and they often become enraged at any criticism of a minority group, no matter how cautious and reasonable. Wait. I just got to... Because they the first time reparations, I've been using it as an example, and now it's being brought up, so... And they show exaggerated anger over trivial matters. For example, they demand payment of... Yeah, that's the because I paused in between trivial and rep, but that's like a like his first example of trivial matters is reparations to black people. Like actually materially addressing the wealth gap of racism is a trivial matter, according to Kaczynski, that these activists are just getting so mad about for no reason. <sighs> It's bullshit. Of reparations to black people, and they often become enraged at any criticism of a minority group, no matter how. That's me. I'm enraged about not any criticism of a min well, a criticism of a minority group. It's a weird. Cautious name. and reasonable. In this way, the activists are able to maintain the illusion that they are rebelling against. Trumpists, people who support Trump are a minority group, you know, technically a minority of the population. They're not a political minority in that they lack political power, but they're a numerical minority. So, I don't, you know, not any criticism of a minority group. Um, I've seen articles criticizing black men for misogyny. They're members of a minority group. I've seen articles criticizing gay men for misogyny or racism or femphobia all sorts of things they're members of a minority group just doesn't seem right and the system, correct but the illusion is absurd agitation against racism sexism homophobia and the like no more constitutes rebellion against the system than does agitation against political graft and corruption those who work against graft and corruption are not rebelling but acting as the system's enforcers they're helping to keep the politicians obedient to the rules of the system those who work against racism sexism and homophobia similarly are acting as the system the working against corruption in this system is against the system even though corruption is against the rules of the system because if you actually ended all corruption in the system the system would be so fundamentally transformed that it wouldn't be the same system anymore like if we got rid of all corruption in the electoral process including empowering everybody with all the information they need to make informed decisions to vote on all the issue like to to fulfill the ideal of democracy that is part of the system that that is corrupted against like when i think of corruption i have to think of like politicians taking bribes and whatnot being a big issue um so to to eliminate that kind of corruption would be to fundamentally change the system because the system says that people with more property can have more say in the political system which goes against what the system says about valuing democracy and being against corruption because that is corruption but it's also property rights so working against corruption isn't part of the system like it's not doing the system's work for it because it would destroy the system if they succeeded systems enforcers they help the system to suppress the deviant racist sexist and homophobic attitudes that cause problems for the system but the activists don't act only as the system's enforcers they also serve as a kind of lightning rod that protects the system by drawing public resentment away from the system and its institutions for example there were several reasons why it was to the system's advantage to get women out of the home and into the workplace years ago if the system as represented by the government or the media had begun out of the blue a propaganda campaign designed to make it socially acceptable for women to center their lives on careers rather than on the home the natural human resistance to change would have caused widespread public resentment what actually happened was that the changes were spearheaded by radical feminists behind whom the system's institutions trailed at a safe distance the resentment of the more conservative members of society was directed primarily so feminists argued for actual liberation of women the system noticed that these arguments were gaining sway among the population recuperated those energies and yes turned it into something beneficial for them like you know two income households becoming the norm because everyone's in the workforce now 
it's not that the liberation of women inherently means we have to switch to two income how like we could have kept wages the same and made it normal that sometimes women work sometimes men work or they can both work part time and be home with the kids more family values you know like <sighs> the system the the version of women's liberation that was incorporated by the system benefits the system yes that's true that's how it exploits the impulse to rebel it's not that being in favor of women's liberation is truly the system's position quote unquote the system because again true women's liberation wouldn't have been good for the system like to truly liberate women would be to truly liberate all people from poverty, from unequal distribution of political power based on wealth and property. Like there's <laughs> true liberation of women is antithetical to the system as it's set up. Against the radical feminists rather than against the system and its institutions, because the changes sponsored by the system seem slow and moderate in comparison with the more radical solutions advocated by feminists. And even these relatively slow changes were seen as having been forced on the system by pressure from the radicals. They're not just slow. They're in a particular groove. They're, they're ignoring very specific things, very important things. It's... It's not just that we're moving towards a feminist utopia slowly under capitalism. It's that elements of feminism have been able to be incorporated, but not all of them and not the important ones. And it's not just that it's moving slowly towards those important ones. It's that it's redirecting energy away from those important ones by, giving, by bait and switching, by offering this corporate version. Part three, the system's neatest trick. So in a nutshell, the system's neatest trick is this. A, for the sake of its own efficiency and security, the system needs to bring about deep and radical social changes to match the changed conditions resulting from technological progress. That is kind of true. Like the system does need to do that. It has to adapt to the reality of the world if it wants to survive. And to an extent, technological progress is what's causing some of these changes. Like I'm talking about again, people living in closer proximity, the world getting smaller due to the internet, due to transportation, te like that's technological process, making diversity and the ability to for people who historically haven't heard, had their voices heard, making them heard now, that's all related to the progress of technology for sure. Um, I agree with that. And the system is having to recuperate those energies and to, to, to the system's having to adapt to that reality. B, the frustration of life under the circumstances imposed by the system leads to rebellious impulses. C, rebellious impulses are co-opted by the system in the service of the social changes it requires. Activists rebel against the old and outmoded values that are no longer of use to the system and in favor of the new values that the system needs us to accept. No, I was so until the second half of number three came up, I was like, oh, I actually agree with all of it. But that's where the, the th like, <sighs> the activists aren't in general rebelling in favor of new values that the system wants us to accept. The activists are rebelling against. the unequal distribution of wealth and political power. <sighs> between people of different races, different sexes, but just of, between people in general. And truly equalizing that out aren't new values that the system wants us to accept. D. Because the system couldn't exist if those were truly accepted. In this way, rebellious impulses, which otherwise might have been dangerous to the system, are given an outlet that is not only harmless to the system, but useful to it. E. Much of the public resentment resulting from the imposition of social changes is drawn away from the system and its institutions, and is directed instead at the radicals who spearhead the social changes. 
Of course, this trick was not planned in advance by the system's leaders, who are not conscious of having played a trick at all. The way it works is something like this. In deciding what position to take on any issue, the editors, publishers, and owners of the media must consciously or unconsciously balance several factors. They must consider how their readers or viewers will react to what they print or broadcast about the issue. They must consider how their advertisers, their peers in the media, and other powerful persons will react. And they must consider the effect on the security of the system of what they print or broadcast. These practical considerations will usually outweigh whatever personal feelings they may have about the issue. Yes, this is how these activist causes get neutered. It's not smoke-filled. This is all true. This is all good, good, true stuff. It's not people... When I, I assign agency to the system, I'm talking about meta effects, systemic effects. I'm not talking about people making decisions. And they're explaining that really well here. Um, but just with the missing context that what the result of this process is, isn't activists um, pushing for things the system needs. It's the system taking the energies of activists and offering what it can to make a version of them that fits with it. The personal feeling of the media leaders, their advertisers, or other powerful persons are varied. They may be liberal or conservative, religious or atheistic. The only universal common ground among the leaders is their commitment to the system, its security and its power. Therefore, within the limits imposed by what the public is willing to accept, the principal factor determining the attitudes propagated by the media is a rough consensus of opinion among the media leaders and other powerful people as to what is good for the system. Thus, when an editor or other media leader sets out to decide what attitude to take toward a movement or a cause, his first thought is whether the movement includes anything that is good or bad for the system. Maybe he tells himself that his decision is based on moral, philosophical, or religious grounds, but it is an observable fact that in practice, the security of the system takes precedence over all other factors in determining the attitude of the media. For example, if a news magazine editor looks at the militia movement, he may or may not sympathize personally with some of its grievances and goals, but he also sees that there will be a strong consensus among his advertisers and his peers in the media that the militia movement is potentially dangerous to the system, and therefore should be discouraged. Under these circumstances, he knows that his magazine had better take a negative attitude towards the militia movement. The <laughs> News coverage of militia movements has gotten much less favorable in recent years, but like even back with like was it Clive and Bundy that thing like there was still a fair amount of relatively positive portrayal of that fairly recently just something I thought to mention but also <sighs> the system doesn't just yeah i'm just gonna repeat myself negative attitude of the media presumably is part of the reason why the militia movement has died down when the same editor looks at radical feminism he sees that some has it died down maybe it's just because this is old published in 2010 i think that makes sense that was probably even before Bundy. Yeah, yeah, that was in like 2012 or 13 or something. More extreme solutions would be dangerous to the system, but he also sees that feminism holds much that is useful to the system. Women's participation in the business and technical world integrates them and their families better into the system. Their talents are of service to the system in business and technical matters. Feminist emphasis on ending domestic abuse and rape also serves the system's needs, since rape and abuse, like other forms of violence, are dangerous to the system. Just... Yeah, to the extent that the system is a well-functioning society, yeah, having women's contributions involved in it's good for society. Like, it's almost like, like, it's such a weird thing to say. Like, the implication of this is almost that supporting these things is bad because it's pro the system and the system is bad. But, like, ugh. Again, it just seems like the system incorporating something that's obvious because it has to, not because it's fundamental to the system. Like, it's fu it's fundamental to the system in the way that, like, it's just, yeah, it's obvious if you take off the patriarchy blinders that it's good to have the contributions of women in society. <sighs> Doesn't mean it's, like, a nefarious or bad thing, or, like that the historical thrust of the system isn't still in favor of patriarchy because most of the people who have power in the system currently are still men. Perhaps most important, the editor recognizes that the pettiness and meaninglessness of modern housework and the social isolation of the modern housewife can lead to serious frustration for many women, frustration that will cause problems for the system unless women are allowed an outlet through careers in the business and technical world. 
Even if this editor is a macho type who personally feels more comfortable with women in a subordinate position, he knows that feminism, at least in a relatively moderate form, is good for the system. He knows that his editorial posture must be favorable towards moderate feminism. Otherwise, he will face the disapproval of his advertisers and other powerful people. This is why the mainstream media's attitude has been generally supportive of moderate feminism, mixed towards radical feminism, and consistently hostile only towards the most extreme feminist positions. Through this type of process, rebel movements that are dangerous to the system the extreme ones being the ones that would actually fix the are problem. subjected to negative propaganda, while rebel movements that are believed to be useful to the system are given cautious encouragement in the media. <laughs> kind of. Yeah, like... Unconscious absorption of media propaganda influences would-be rebels to rebel in ways that serve the interests of the system. The university intellectuals also play an important role in carrying out the system's trick. Though they like to fancy themselves independent thinkers, the intellectuals are, allowing for individual exceptions, the most over-socialized, the most conformist, the tamest and most domesticated, the most pampered, dependent, and spineless group in America today. As a result, their impulse to rebel is particularly strong. But, because they are incapable of independent thought, real rebellion is- Who's incapable? Like, academics are incapable of independent thought? It's just- that's- uh, bit polemical for my taste, I guess, but real rebellion is impossible for them. Impossible for them. Consequently, they are suckers for the system's trick, which allows them to irritate people and enjoy the illusion of rebelling without ever having to challenge the system's basic values. Because they- <laughs> they are the What are the system's values? Is, is drinking from a male tears mug going to change the whole system? No. Does it kind of poking at some of the historical values of the system? And is it pointing at something we still might need to actually address materially in terms of power between men and women in society? Maybe. Like, just because it's not the most revolutionary action in the world doesn't mean that it's pro the system's values. I know that the male tears mug isn't actually the text of Kaczynski, but it's what this editor chose to show. Teachers of young people, the university intellectuals are in a position to help the system play its trick on the young, which they do by steering young people's rebellious impulses towards the standard stereotyped targets, racism, colonialism, women's issues, etc. A stereotype, is it colonialism is a stereotyped target? Like... I don't know, most primitivists seem, I thought, had more respect for, like, the reality of what colonialism did to, at the very least, like, the indigenous people that they often, like, you know, ray of, like, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, um, noble, savage, whatever vision of society that primitivists often, I don't know, I'm stereotyping, now I'm getting sub- self-conscious about oh the good primitivists but uh <laughs> um yeah right. young people who are not college students learn through the media or through personal contact of the social justice issues for which students rebel and they imitate the students thus a youth culture develops in which there is a stereotyped mode of rebellion that spreads through imitation of peers just as hairstyles clothing styles and other fads spread through imitation it's true that the aesthetics of rebellion spread as aesthetics, as fashion, as what like other fads. Like that that happens, but that doesn't necessarily say anything about the content. Like just because the system allows a particular type of rebellion in an aesthetic sense doesn't mean that a deep actual version of that rebellion wouldn't be against the system. I'm not going to send any fan mail. What is going on? Part four, the trick is not perfect. 
I don't know what this Naturally, is. Naturally, the system's trick does not work perfectly. Not all of the positions adopted by the activist community are consistent with the needs of the system. Oh, of course. Right. <laughs> Spent all this time talking as if they were, but it's good to mention that they're not. I wonder if they'll do justice to this topic. And like, maybe this is the point in the article where everything I've been talking about this whole time gets addressed in a full way. They provide arguments against what I've been saying uh, and make the positions make sense. In this connection, some of the most important difficulties that confront the system are related to the conflict between the two different types of propaganda that the system has to use, integration propaganda and agitation propaganda. This is like promising. End note number four. The concepts of integration propaganda and agitation propaganda are discussed by Jacques Gilles in his book Propaganda, published by Alfred A. Knopf, 1965. Integration propaganda is the principal mechanism of socialization in modern society. It is propaganda that is designed to instill in people the attitudes, beliefs, values, and habits that they need to have in order to be safe and the useful tools of the system. <sighs> Showing diversity and th like, again, it's not the text, so it's just, just subtext. Hmm. Yeah. <sighs> Valuing diversity doesn't just make you a useful tool of the system. It makes you an accurate describer of the value of having different perspectives in the like. It teaches people to permanently repress or sublimate those emotional impulses that are dangerous to the system. This is kind of true in a way, just that sentence in isolation as I'm doing my play pause thing. Um, but I don't think it's the impulses that Kaczynski seems to think it is. Its focus is on long-term attitudes and deep-seated values of broad applicability rather than on attitudes towards specific current issues. Agitation propaganda plays on people's emotions so as to bring out certain attitudes or behaviors in specific current situations. Instead of teaching people to suppress dangerous emotional impulses, it seeks to stimulate certain emotions for well-defined purposes localized in time. The system needs an orderly, docile, cooperative, passive, dependent population. Above all, it requires a non-violent population since it needs the government to have a monopoly on the use of physical force. For this reason, integration propaganda has to teach us to be horrified, frightened, and appalled by violence, so that we will not be tempted to use it even when we are very angry. By violence, I mean physical attacks on human beings. More generally, integration propaganda has to teach us soft, cuddly values that emphasize non-aggressiveness, interdependence, and cooperation. On the other hand, in certain contexts, the system itself finds it useful or necessary to... Yeah, there's a contradiction here, though, because if the system wants to... talk about equality and anti-racism, anti-sexism, all these cuddly values seriously. And if they're saying that it benefits the system for people to seriously hold these cuddly diversity values in earnest because it makes them less, like it might make people less interpersonally aggressive against each other but it doesn't make them less aggressive against the system that is still maintaining the material effects of these issues. Right? So like, The more that I've understood anti-racism, anti-sexism, anti-homophobia, the historical weight of these things and how they affect the current time, the more angry I've been at how things are in the world right now. It hasn't made me, it hasn't made me want to like do violence against anyone because I don't, I can't think of a situation in which that would be useful or effective, but it's not the only ways to fight the system. And there are people who aren't me for whom understanding these issues has increased their desire to be aggressive against the system. So to say that understanding these issues increase, decreases aggression full stop, like in a sense, I agree with that because it decreases aggression amongst <laughs> the working class. Like if the working class stopped being racist to each other, homophobic, sexist, 
and united on all these things against the system to actually address the material power imbalances that exist that make up these things that they're against, then change would happen. Resort to brutal, aggressive methods to achieve its own objectives. The most obvious example of such methods is warfare. In wartime, the system relies on agitation propaganda in order to win public approval of military action. What about the activists here? They're never in favor of war. Plays on people's emotions to make them feel frightened and angry at their real or supposed enemy. In this situation, there is a conflict between integration propaganda and agitation propaganda. Those people in whom the cuddly values and the... I like that they're at least acknowledging there's different streams of what the the they the system are pushing for are pushing for violence have been most deeply planted can't easily be persuaded to approve a bloody military operation hence the system's trick backfires to some extent the activists who have been rebelling all along in favor of the values of integration propaganda continue to do so during wartime they oppose the war effort not only because it is violent but because it is racist colonialist imperialist etc yeah 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 it is and that's why the things that they're against aren't things that the system truly supports. All of this is like you just debunked your whole first two sections with that sentence. Which are contrary to the soft, cuddly values taught by integration propaganda. Yeah. The system's trick also backfires where the treatment of animals is concerned. Inevitably, many people extend to animals the soft values and the aversion to violence that they are taught with respect to humans. They are horrified by the slaughter of animals for meat and by other practices harmful to animals, such as the reduction of chickens to egg-laying machines kept in tiny cages, or the use of animals in scientific experiments. Up to a point, the resulting opposition to mistreatment of animals may be useful to the system. Because a vegan diet is more efficient in terms of resource utilization than a carnivorous one is, veganism, if widely adopted, will help to ease the burden placed on the Earth's limited resources by the growth of the human population. But activists' insistence on ending the use of animals in scientific experiments is squarely in conflict with the system's needs, since for the foreseeable future, there is not likely to be any workable substitute for living animals as research subjects. All the same, the fact that the system's trick does backfire here and there does not prevent it from being, on the whole, a remarkably effective device for turning rebellious impulses to the system's advantage. I wouldn't call that the trick backfire, but th those are certainly points where, yeah, again, this just seems to undermine so much of what they were saying earlier, that these, these activist impulses are truly serving the system and not merely being recuperated or utilized by the system to something other than the activists' actual full ends. Like, this just seems to... Yeah, they're, they seem to be acknowledging some of the things I'm talking about, but not integrating in a way that I understand yet. There's still time left. It has to be conceded that the trick described here is not the only factor determining the direction that rebellious impulses take in our society. Yeah, oh yeah, this, uh, determining the direction of the rebellious impulses, that's the disagreement, like, that the system is determining the direction of the impulses rather than the direction of the impulses being a result of like humanism and empathy and like understanding each other better because of technological change, but because the system is pushing it. That's the thing that hasn't been justified, that the causality is coming from the system to the activists and not just that the system is recuperating. Like that's what that's a fundamental part of the disagreement here, I think. Many people today feel weak and powerless <clears throat> for the very good reason that the system really does make us weak and powerless, and therefore identify obsessively with victims, with the weak and the oppressed. That's part of the reason why victimization issues, such as racism, sexism, homophobia, and neocolonialism, have become standard activist issues. Wait, that's it? That's the reason why they've become standard? Wait, let me watch that again. <laughs> factor determining the direction that rebellious impulses take in our society. Many people today feel weak and powerless for the very good reason that the system really does make us weak and powerless, and therefore identify obsessively with victims, with the weak and the oppressed. That's part of the reason why victimization issues such as racism, sexism, homophobia, and neo -colonial. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, maybe they're identify like, maybe people care about the weak and oppressed as soon as they understand the struggles. Like, I know for me, as someone who didn't understand everything about racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, etc., 
from birth only kind of came to understand in the last couple, few years uh for me becoming more aware of the problems different people face along these different lines engaged my empathy for them it wasn't just that i feel powerless and therefore i'm obsessed with all powerless but it's that i'd like i do think that power should be more fairly distributed as like a principle i have more equally distributed and when i become more aware of parts of society where that value is even less fulfilled than i originally thought i relate to that my my desire for justice is engaged it's it's a weird way to frame it kaczynski part five an example I have with me an anthropology textbook in which I've noticed several nice examples of the way in which university intellectuals help the system with its trick by disguising conformity as criticism of modern society. The cutest of these examples is found on pages 132 to 36, where the author quotes, in adapted form, an article by one Rhonda K. Williamson, an intersexed person that is a person born with both male and female physical characteristics. Williamson states that the American Indians not only accepted intersexed persons, but especially valued them. End note number six. I assume that this statement is accurate. It certainly reflects the Navajo attitude. See Gladys A. Reichard, Navajo Religion, A Study of Symbolism. This book was originally copyrighted in 1950, well before American anthropology became heavily politicized, so I see no reason to suppose that its information is slanted. She contrasts this attitude with the Euro-American attitude, which she equates with the attitude that her own parents adopted towards her. Williamson's parents mistreated her cruelly. They held her in contempt for her intersex condition. They told her she was cursed and given over to the devil, and they took her to charismatic churches to have the demon cast out of her. She was even given napkins onto which she was supposed to cough out the demon. But it is obviously ridiculous to equate this with the modern Euro-American attitude. It may approximate the Euro-American yeah. attitude of 150 years ago, but nowadays almost any American educator, psychologist, or mainstream clergyman would be horrified at that kind of treatment of an intersexed person. Ye I don't know about that clergy people i think most of those examples educators etc probably would be horrified by that yeah but i don't know also if that's the general euro like i think yeah most people here especially the way it's described here it just sounds cruel and i think most people would get that it's cruel because again basic empathy but the media would never dream of portraying such treatment in a favorable light Average middle-class Americans today may not be as accepting of the intersex condition as the Indians were, but few would fail to recognize the cruelty of the way in which Williamson was treated. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I agree. Williamson's parents obviously were deviants, religious kooks, whose attitudes and beliefs were way out of line with the values of the system. I don't know if they were way out of line, but... Thus, yeah, while was... putting on a show of criticizing modern Euro-American society, Williamson really is attacking only deviant minorities and cultural laggards who have not yet adopted to the dominant values of present-day America. I mean, in a sense, that's true. But again, like just framing these ongoing material effects on people, like, God, when you're talking about intersex people, the material effects being like people who are given surgeries at, yeah, it's just there's some real material fucking horrible shit that intersex people have had to deal with. Um, and even like material shit, they still have to deal with and that like some of them don't want to identify as men or women and, um, acceptance of non-binary gender identities, whether you're intersex or not, is not super well accepted by like, yeah, there, there's a lot of work being done with the hand wave of maybe society's not up to where the Indians are. And I don't want to ray of like i keep using the word ray of i don't want to like put native culture like i don't know what every native culture thought about intersex people i do think i do seem to understand that many of them were far better on this issue than uh euro uh culture was and has been and even to some extent to some large extent still is but um yeah. Haviland, the author of the book, on page 12, portrays cultural anthropology as iconoclastic, as challenging the assumptions of modern Western society. This is so far contrary to the truth that it would be funny if it weren't so pathetic. The mainstream of modern American anthropology is abjectly subservient to the values and assumptions of the system. 
just because acknowledging this is now mainstream in anthropology doesn't mean that it's the totality of the system again with the there's so much hand waving of the the ongoing material effects of things as just lingering whatever's that don't really matter. The real system now is the new hegemony or in the last ten years where people have kind of become aware of these issues. It's now the whole it's the when today's anthropologists pretend to challenge the values of their society, typically they challenge only the values of the past, obsolete and outmoded values now held by no one but deviants and laggards who have not kept up with the cultural changes that the system requires of us. Haviland's use of Williamson's article illustrates this very well, and it represents the general slant of Haviland's book. Haviland plays up ethnographic facts that teach his readers politically correct lessons, but he understates or omits altogether ethnographic facts that are politically incorrect. Thus, while he quotes Williamson's account to emphasize the Indians' acceptance of intersexed persons, he does not mention, for example, that among many of the Indian tribes, women who committed adultery had their noses cut off. End note number seven. This is well known. See, e.g., Angie Debo, Geronimo, the man, his time, his place. Thomas B. Marquise, interpreter, wooden leg, a warrior who fought Custer, Stanley Vestal, sitting bull, champion of the Sioux, a biography. Assuming that this is true, I don't know exactly what point is being made here. Like, just because some anthropologists or intersex people want to point out that some indigenous first nations like different different cultural groups among those people had better opinions on inter it doesn't mean they're gonna necessarily be perfect on all intersectional lines and i don't want to just downplay who was it cutting noses like a woman's nose off for it's not just not being perfect it's a long it's not being it's extremely misogynistic and sexist and horrible but like i don't understand the point being made here like if anthropology was yeah i don't know the new encyclopedia britannica volume 13 macropedia 15th edition 1997 article american people native Whereas no such punishment was inflicted on male adulterers, or that among the Crow Indians, a warrior who was struck by a stranger had to kill the offender immediately, else he was irretrievably disgraced in the eyes of his tribe. Nor does Haviland discuss the habitual use of torture by the Indians of the eastern United States. End note number nine. Yeah, maybe maybe the article they're talking about is a broad comparison of Euro-American value, and it's not specifically about intersex people, in which case it seems fair to say maybe if it, if it was doing the noble savage thing of, oh, they were so great and ignoring potentially, I don't know if these specific bad things are true. Assume maybe they are or things like them probably were. I don't think any particular culture in the past has been perfect. Um, but so what? It doesn't mean we can't point out the ways in which their values were better than ours in specific ways. Use of torture by the Indians of the Eastern US is well known. And what does this have to do with an example of activists being led by the system. C. E. G. Clark Whistler, Indians of the United States, Revised Edition. Joseph Campbell, The Power of Myth. The New Encyclopedia Britannica, Volume 13, Macropedia, 15th Edition, 1997. Article, American People, Native. James Axtell, The Invasion Within. The Contest of might represent violence, machismo, and gender discrimination. Hence, they are inconsistent with the present-day values of the system and tend to get censored out as politically incorrect. What? If all these things are against the values of the system, then wouldn't it be to the system's benefit to point out how they happened historically and how they were bad? Like, I guess what they're saying is that the system needs to pretend that Native American cultures were inherently better than Euro-American cultures in all ways and ever, like in order to maintain some illusion. It's a very confused, but it seemed to just be like relying on some sort of intuition that I'm not having to understand this. Yet I don't doubt that Haviland is perfectly sincere in his belief that anthropologists challenge the assumptions of Western society. The capacity for self-deception of our university intellectuals will easily stretch that far. To conclude, I want to make clear that I'm not suggesting that it is good to cut off noses for adultery or that any other abuse of women should be tolerated. Good. Nor would I want to see anybody scorned or rejected because they are intersexed, or because of their race, religion, sexual... I just have to comment on the ED, intersexed. That's just... Uh, 
yeah, I don't know. It's from 2010. I'm not going to ding Kaczynski for that, but it is just a weird, I'm, <laughs> I understand why transgender people and intersex people have fought against the transgendered, like as if it's a state of, yeah, it's a weird to add the ED on and use it as a descriptor for people. Orientation, etc., etc., etc. But in our society today, these matters are, at most, issues of reform. The system's neatest trick. No, they're fundamental. like, <laughs> to fundamentally address all these issues, as I pointed out, would completely destroy it. It's not an issue of reform, because you can't do it just within the system. Like, you could maybe reform, reform in an incrementalist approach to actually completely change the system, the difference between reformism and incrementalism. But I don't think... Kaczynski's talking about that. ...insists in having turned powerful, rebellious impulses, which otherwise might have taken a revolutionary direction, to the service of these modest reforms. Okay, great. That was it. Jeez, this takes this does take a long time. Uh, but yeah, thanks for watching my first non-stream partial stream thing. I'm trying to think if I have any like closing thoughts, but I'm mostly just like tired from doing this for two hours, I think so far, something like that. Um, and yeah, I feel like I really drilled home all my points over and over again during the video, so I probably don't need to repeat them, but yeah sound off in the comment let me know what you think of this type of content i'd like to do more of it i'd like to have uh do some of it with sean sometimes sean's busy animating right now uh animating away on papa and boy our means tv show that's going to be premiering uh hopefully at the end of the summer uh cartoon about the papa and boy universe that has begun uh in our podcast you can check out the papa and boy podcast episodes uh super excited for this cartoon that we're doing like it's really it's gonna be so good um to, i can't i can't wait for people to see it um but yeah no i was just excited to do a different type of content and something that I'm going to edit now, but honestly, there's not too many edits. A few in, more in the beginning, I think, than towards the end, but I'm going to try to be pretty light with my touch. And uh, yeah, let me know what you think. If you want more of this content, if you're excited for me to... Uh, I can take these off. I'm not listening to the video. There's a reading of this essay that I could almost agree with, but what it's not saying and what it glosses over seems to really speak volumes to me about what isn't being understood here. Uh, but yeah, thank you everyone for watching. Let me know what you think. I want to do more of this type of content. I like doing it. Uh, let me know anything I should change or do. Probably should use a chair that doesn't squeak. I'm not sure how audible all that was. I guess I'll find out. But uh, yeah, I'm going to do some really extremely basic editing and try to upload this right away. Thanks for, thanks for watching.